a haunting discovery. I work for NASA as an astronomer, and there are certain things we keep hidden from the public. No, the Earth isn't flat, and aliens don't control the government. Hell, I wish those were the case, as the truth is much, much worse. In 1993, the Hubble Space Telescope saw a star disappear. It didn't go supernova, or die naturally. It simply went dark, over the span of a few minutes. This star was already too faint to see with the naked eye, and ground-based telescopes had trouble picking it out from among the surrounding stars, so the event wasn't widely known to the public. At the time, we thought the most likely explanation was that a cloud of interstellar dust had drifted between Earth and the star, occluding it from view. It was noted, and mostly forgotten about. In 2007, two more stars vanished. Due to the circumstances of this event, this was much more concerning. The two stars in question were part of a binary system, orbiting each other at a fairly close distance. If a cloud of dust was the culprit again, they would have both seemed to disappear simultaneously, or very close to it. Instead, both stars faded individually over a period of minutes, separated by a span of about eight hours. This binary system was also about 15 light years closer to Earth than the star that had previously disappeared in 1993. After carefully reviewing millions of Hubble images, two more stars were identified which had gone out in the years 1995 and 2002. These were all in the same stellar neighbourhood, only a handful of light years from each other. The only conclusion we could draw was that some unknown influence travelling close to the speed of light was shrouding or even destroying these stars. Unfortunately, the Hubble wasn't sensitive enough to tell us any more than that. The James Webb Space Telescope first came online a few months ago. Although official channels will tell you it's still undergoing testing, we've been actively collecting data since early February. One of the first things we did was to aim the telescope at the regions of space occupied by the vanished stars. If they were just being blocked by dust clouds, a hope some of us still held on to, the increased sensitivity of the JWST may have been able to see through them and confirm that the stars were still there. Unfortunately, we had no such luck. The first three stars which had disappeared were still completely dark. Gravitational wave detectors, though, soon found something odd. In all cases, not only were the stellar masses still present, but the amount of mass had actually increased. More sensitive observations had also detected a type of string, or web, stretching through space, connecting these now invisible stars. When we trained the telescope on the binary system that had vanished in 2007, which was the nearest point at which this phenomenon had so far been observed, there was finally enough ambient spectrum radiation left to try a mass spectrometer reading. If you're not aware, mass spectrometry is an incredibly useful process, whereby measuring the patterns of light wavelengths emitted or reflected by an object, we can learn tons of useful information, such as its temperature, speed, direction of movement, and chemical composition. The readings we got from the binary stars didn't make any sense. First of all, they were cold. Almost as cold as the surrounding space. Whatever had happened to these stars had snuffed them out completely, or somehow prevented their light from escaping. What was truly puzzling, though, were the emission lines returned. Several familiar elements, such as hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and magnesium, were identified, but these were few and far between. Most of the readings didn't correspond to any known chemical elements, and even seemed to defy what we knew about the physics of light, matter and chemistry. This massive star-spanning structure was primarily composed of materials we didn't even have names for, and may not have even been matter as we understand it. Speculation ran rampant. Obviously, such a thing couldn't be a natural phenomenon. Finally, we had proof of extraterrestrial life, but what was this thing we had discovered? and for what purpose was it being built? The leading hypothesis 
was that we were looking at a series of Dyson shells. Massive solar collectors, built to completely envelop stars, in order to capture 100% of their energy output. Such a concept had been envisioned in the early 20th century as a potential source of energy for an interstellar civilization. Since then, the idea has found its way into popular science fiction. The construction of these massive structures had actually been theorised to be one of the first signs of intelligent extraterrestrial life that we may someday detect. It seemed that day was today. The theory still didn't explain everything though. First of all, there was the impossible speed with which the stars were covered. Constructing a Dyson shell from scratch in a matter of minutes was beyond even the wildest speculations of scientists and sci-fi writers. Then there were the mysterious filaments that connected the shells over distances of light years. No one had any idea what purpose these could serve, or how they could even be built. Everyone at NASA was fascinated by this mystery. In hindsight, we may have been better off if we had never discovered the truth. Less than a month ago, the JWST detected a series of unusual energy bursts emanating from interstellar space. These were occurring at the very edge of a star system, approximately 12 light years from the binary system that vanished in 2007. As we focused the telescope on this system, we soon determined that these were not natural phenomena either. The energy signatures, which were flashing intermittently, matched what would be expected from thermonuclear and antimatter-based explosions, along with several other types of energies that we couldn't identify. These explosions although still not visible to the naked eye on Earth from that distance, were absolutely tremendous in magnitude, easily billions of times more powerful than any nuke that humanity could conceivably build. After experimenting with the telescope settings, we were able to get a clearer picture of what was going on. The tip of one of the interstellar filaments that linked the Dyson system was passing through the Oort cloud of the distant star system approaching its sun, and whoever lived there was fighting back. Their weapons were able to slow the thing's advance, shattering, breaking off and vaporising planet-sized chunks of the object, but it seemed to be rebuilding itself almost as fast as it was being destroyed. After less than a week, the explosions stopped. It seems that they had run out of ammunition. In the void between stars, we knew that these things travelled at nearly the speed of light, but as we watched it approach the inner star system, its pace slowed as it swelled in size, preparing to devour the system's star. We quickly trained the telescope's mirrors on the doomed sun. We were about to watch whatever this thing was blot out another star, but in real time. We all held our breath as we watched the projected image of the main sequence star, slightly larger than our own sun. At first, nothing seemed to be happening, but soon, a small shadow appeared on the edge of the luminous orb, soon followed by another shadow, and then a third. The shadows began to converge, forming a strange, yet somehow familiar pattern as they blocked out the star's light. W what are those? One of my colleagues gasped. They almost look like... She paused, as if afraid to say the next word for fear of ridicule. I, however, had no such hesitancy. Leaves, I said, my voice monotone. The situation was far too incredible to express any emotional reaction, even that of pure shock. They looked like leaves. We watched, as over a period of minutes, a web of shadowy outlines, matching the familiar shapes of oblong leaves and thin vines, proceeded to blot out the remaining light from the distant star. By that point, everyone in the room had realised the truth. The phenomenon we had been tracking for so many years wasn't some hyper-advanced alien megastructure. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and magnesium, some of the few familiar elements we had detected, they were all components of chlorophyll. It was a plant, an enormous plant that spanned across light years, and, much like terrestrial plants, it sought out light to fuel itself. The filaments connecting the stars across interstellar space were stems, branches, 
it would grow in the direction of the nearest stars it sensed, completely enveloping them and then moving on. Any life inhabiting planets orbiting those stars would be left to freeze to death, or perhaps even worse, it was possible that the plant would devour those planets to add to its mass as well. Everyone was silent as the telescope continued to gather data. Eventually, after what seemed like an eternity, a young astronomer spoke up from the far end of the room, addressing our supervisor. Sir, we've begun to detect the formation of another tendril leaving the system. Its vector is... he gulped. He didn't need to say any more, but he did anyway. It's heading directly for our sun. How much time do we have? The supervisor replied grimly. Judging by the time lag, distance, relativistic properties, and previously observed speeds of this thing, I'd estimate no more than 27 years, sir. 27 years. We had just watched this galactic weed overwhelm a civilization that was, at the very least, thousands of years ahead of us technologically, and we had less than three decades. I'll probably be found and silenced for posting this, but I don't care. I have to tell someone. I can't keep this a secret any longer. When the sun turns black and the world begins to freeze, at least you'll have some idea of what's going on. Small comfort, it may be. The Wormhole They gave me a million bucks to keep my trap shut, and I did, for fifteen years. But last night I was making the rounds, and I saw the professor again. I had a heart attack three years back, and I tell you, when I saw him standing there in front of room 204, I felt another one coming on. He turned and smiled, and it was like he hadn't aged a day in fifteen years. Hey there, chief he said, and that was it. I dropped my clipboard on the ground and hightailed it out of there, never looking back. What I'm able to tell you is liable to make me sound crazier than a three-horned goat, but I promise you there's crazier things out there. The cops don't believe me. The official story is that the professor and those students died 15 years ago. Room 204 just up and exploded, they said. Damn this thing and there's some truth there. That room did explode, but it wasn't an accident. We knew exactly what we were doing, or we thought we did. They call me an assistant supervisor of maintenance, but really I'm a janitor and always have been. You might wonder why I'm still at it after getting that million bucks. That dough is for Junior, so he doesn't have to go through the same rubbish that I did. The night this happened, I was assigned to the Astrophysics Centre a bit northwest of the main Harvard campus. Until that night, this was always my favourite beat. I mean, God help you if you wound up at one of those biology labs. Those goddamn dead, cut open animals all over the place used to give me nightmares. And really, thinking back, I'd take those nightmares of mutilated and scattered organs any night over the stuff that has haunted me ever since. Anyway, I was there mopping the hallway on the second floor of the lab building when the door to room 204 opened up and this guy popped his head out hey you I looked around to make sure he was talking to me yes can I help you sir I thought he was going to moan about the room being a mess or something how'd you like to make a thousand bucks chief an hour's work at most easy money does that sound good to you it sure did things were tight at home as they always were. A thousand would knock off some of these long overdue bills. But I was also on a tight schedule. They didn't give you much breathing room. Don't want you standing around thinking about it, I guess. That sounds great, I said. But I got to stick to my beat. The man laughed. We're about to make history, Chief, he said. And you're worried about emptying the bathroom trash? Come on, don't sweat it. You won't get in trouble, I promise. I'm a professor here, I'll vouch for you. The guy did look like a professor, with carefully combed grey hair and big old glasses on his face. I shrugged, leaned my mop against the wall and said, Sure, what do I have to do? That's fantastic. Come on in, chief, come on in. I followed him into the room. One look, and I should have just turned around there and then, 
and told him to keep his damn money. But I didn't. As soon as I stepped in, I felt the little hairs all over my body stand up. I don't mean I was scared. I mean like there was an electrical charge in that room, and I had a guess about where it was coming from. There, in the centre of the room, on a round table, was a large glass globe, crackling with electricity, like what you'd see if you go into a kid's science museum, like they somehow created a lightning storm in a glass ball. This one was sort of vibrating around on its stand and buzzing, and the lightning inside was black. I could feel the electricity coming from it from across the room. There were four kids there, students, I guessed, sitting in a row of chairs along one wall. More than sitting, they were strapped into those chairs, with metal things over their heads, like those big bowl things you see at a hair salon. They all had their eyes closed. Uh, I said. What's going on here? Those kids okay? They're quite fine, said the professor. As to what's going on, as I said, we're about to make history. We're going to open the first wormhole. Wormhole, I said, like in the movies. The professor laughed. I suppose so, chief, he said. Now listen, we had a last minute cancellation, but that's okay because it's an easy job. We're going to be kicking things off here shortly, and once they're properly kicked off, the wormhole will open. I will enter. If I'm not back in 30 minutes, you need to pull that lever there, and this will close the wormhole. I looked to where he was pointing, at a big red lever attached to a giant whirring machine that was hooked up to the metal bowls over the student heads. But, uh, won't you be trapped on the other side of the wormhole? I asked. Not that I had the slightest idea about what the hell was going on. Just so, Chief, said the Professor. We've got this down to two possibilities. One, the wormhole opens up to what we're calling the second universe. The best way I can explain this possibility is that there's a different reality that exists on the other side of this one. The other side of an invisible wall. The wormhole would provide a door in that wall. And the other possibility? that the wormhole will open to a place that man was not meant to go. Thirty minutes will give me enough time to get in and out, if the first possibility is true. And if it's the second, then you'll close the hole with that lever and my students will destroy my work. This was all way above my pay grade and my head was spinning. Why only two possibilities? How the hell did they come up with those two? And if this was real, why the hell would the professor take a coin toss chance of getting stuck in the place that man was not meant to go? I mean, those were just starter questions among the swarm that was buzzing around my head. I see that you have some reservations, said the professor. I assure you that your only job is to pull that lever after 30 minutes. That's it, chief. We'll take care of the rest. And anything that happens isn't on you. The documentation is quite in order. He tapped a folder that was sitting on the circular table. And here, I'll write you a check now, before we proceed. As he wrote out the check, I wondered if it would still be valid if he got swallowed up by the wormhole. I actually had that thought, as crazy as it sounds. It was all still so weird and abstract to me at that point. Here, he said, handing over the check. Let's do it, chief. As soon as I enter that hole, give me exactly thirty minutes, on the dot. That's all you have to do. I took the check, mumbled a thanks, and watched as he walked over to the machine. He pulled the lever. There was a loud crackling sound, and I watched in unease as one by one, the student's eyes shot open. There were no pupils there, like their eyes were rolled back in their sockets. Hey now, I said, taking a step towards the machine. They're quite fine, said the professor, I assure you. Their jaws started to move, like they were grinding their teeth. The professor took a jar of neon blue liquid from the shelf on the wall. He unscrewed the lid and poured the stuff over the electric globe on the round table. The thing started going crazy, and then the globe shattered completely. Bits of glass flying through the air as shoots of black lightning zapped out into the room. I ducked down. I had had enough by then and was getting ready to get the hell out of there. Then it happened. 
a goddamn black hole appeared in the middle of the room, sucking in the bolts of electricity. It grew larger and larger until it took up half the room. All I could hear was this rushing sound, like the world's largest vacuum cleaner running at full throttle. Remember, Chief, shouted the Professor with a wild look on his face. Thirty minutes exactly. Then he stepped into the thing and was gone. At first my mind was a mess, staring at that whooshing black hole that seemed hungry to suck everything in. I looked at the kids hooked up to the machine. Their eyes rolled back. White holes, I guess they looked like with their jaws grinding away like crazy. It was too much to make sense of. I looked down at my watch. Fifteen minutes and thirty-one seconds had gone by since the professor got swallowed up by the wormhole. My heart was pounding, and I kept pacing back and forth, back and forth, trying to work out what the hell was going on. Then I started to zero in on it. I was getting pranked. Not a prank like we used to do as kids, ringing people's doorbells and then running and all that idiocy. I mean a prank like the sophisticated college folk do, where they tell you something's going on, but the whole point is just to observe your reaction. A psychological experiment. Probably cameras in here watching me right now. See what I do. Twelve minutes to go. I saw a trickle of blood come down from one of the kids' noses. I leaned down to look at him closely. He was shaking a little bit, all over. If I throw that lever, this will all probably stop. Maybe that was the test. I had to decide between trapping the professor in the black hole and saving the kids hooked up to the machines. None of it was real, of course, but they didn't know that I knew that. But then, screaming in the back of my mind was that voice. What if it is real? Ten minutes to go. The professor had promised me that the kids were all right. Another one started bleeding from the nose. If it wasn't real, it was a hell of a trick. Where did the professor go, if not through that black hole? I thought about touching it, but whenever I got close, I was filled with total terror. It sure seemed real. Like it really took you some place far, far away from here. I walked over to the table and picked up the folder that was there. Just like the professor had said, the first page was instructions to shut down the machine and destroy it if he didn't return within 30 minutes. I flipped that page over and the next one had a photograph of one of the students. I read what it said. It was a consent form. I, Jackson Stewart, acknowledge the possibility of my imminent death if I participate in this experiment. I am prepared to give my life to science. I flipped that page and there were three more just like it. Now, I'm no lawyer, but there was no way in hell that this experiment was legal, if it was real, even with those consent forms, so it probably wasn't real. And if it was, then the professor lied to me, he had said that the kids were fine, this folder was telling me something else. Two minutes to go. I took a deep breath and paced the room, watching each second tick by. My mind was telling me that none of it was real, but my gut was screaming in horror. I just looked at my watch. It would be over soon enough, one way or the other. Thirty seconds. I walked over to the machine and put my hand on the lever. God damn it, why is he cutting it so close? I watched the seconds tick by and I didn't know if I could do it. I didn't know if I could risk trapping the professor wherever the hell he had gone off to. Five seconds. My hand was shaking. Four seconds. Sweat was pouring down my face, dripping into my eyes. Three seconds. One of the students started to moan. The one that I saw was named Jackson in the folder. Two seconds. One second. Jackson started to shake. Zero seconds. Damn. I tensed my muscles to pull the lever. One look at Jackson, and I knew I had to pull it. He was violently jerking around now. Wait! I snapped my neck around to see the professor's head sticking out of the black hole. Wait, damn it! Then his shoulders were through. I turned back to Jackson. Blood was pouring out of his eyes. I'm almost through. A second kid started to shake. One more second. 
I looked to see that the professor was through. He was back in the room. Do it, he shouted. Two things happened after that, at the exact same time. I heard a wet, popping sound, and I watched as the wormhole disappeared, as though it was never there, but I had never pulled the lever. I slowly turned to look at Jackson. His head was gone. Judging by the bits of brain and splatters of blood on the bowl thing above his neck, his head had just exploded. The whirring of the machine gradually died down, and then it was silent. The three kids who were still alive stopped shaking and closed their eyes. A tragedy, said the professor, pointing at Jackson. But not for nothing. I've been there, I've seen it. Chief, I've seen it. I hunched over and puked. It was weird, but my first thought was, what a mess I'll have to clean up later, I don't know. I guess my mind had sort of shut down and I was going on autopilot. I was the janitor, I cleaned up messes, that was all I knew. Then it hit me, the reality of what had happened. You told me those kids would be okay. The professor put this sickening smug grin on his face. He would have been chief, had you pulled the lever at the 30 minute mark as instructed. You told me to wait. Did I? Yes, you idiot. I'm calling the police. I had a walkie-talkie clipped to my belt. It wouldn't get me the police, but it would certainly get me campus security. I reached for it and had it in my hand when I heard a groan behind me. I turned to see that it was one of the kids. They were waking up. I went over to unstrap them from their chairs. The first kid's eyes blinked open, and when she saw the professor, she started screaming. It's okay, I said. It's all over. She kept screaming. Then the second kid woke up. He looked right at me with wide, terrified eyes. Get us out of here, he shouted. I'm working on it, kid, I said, fumbling at the straps. They were on tight. The third kid woke up. It's here, she said. It made it through. Everything's okay now, I said. Your friend didn't make it, I'm afraid, but it's over. I'll make sure the professor pays for what he did to you and your friends. The first kid was still screaming at the top of her lungs. Get us out of here, shouted the second kid again. The third kid looked me dead in the eyes and in a totally calm voice said, That's not the professor. What? Of course it is, I said. What I saw when I turned to look at the professor will haunt me forever. The professor's mouth was twisting around at odd angles, like something was moving the lower half of his jaw randomly, or like he was trying to get a hair out of his mouth that kept jumping around. The veins on his neck bulged, then sunk back down, then bulged again so they were as thick as ropes. His wrists were rotating in ways they weren't supposed to rotate, as his arms flailed around wildly. I had the first kid, the screaming one, free. She jumped out of the chair and ran to the door. But her legs were wobbly, and she tripped over herself in the middle of the room. I went to work on the second kid, whipping my head around every second to look at the professor. It looked like there was something crawling around under his skin. Something big. Get us out of here, the second kid shouted yet again. The first kid was still on the ground, screaming. I worked away furiously on the straps. If you believe in God, said the third kid with an eerie calm, then pray. I took a glance at the professor, and that's when the first bone burst out of his chest, through his suit. I call it a bone, but it was pure black and dripping with green slime. As for me, said the third kid, I don't believe there's a god, not after what I've seen. The second kid was free and made a run for it. I scooted over to the third kid, but watched as the professor reached out an arm and grabbed the second kid by the top of his head. The professor gave one quick twist and let go. I heard a terrible snap and the kid slumped to the ground. Three more black bones came out of the professor's chest, dripping. He laughed and bent down to the first kid, who was still screaming, as bones began to poke out of his back like a damn stegosaurus from hell. What is that thing? I asked as I fumbled at the straps of the last kid. It doesn't belong here. 
You don't say, I said, getting one strap free. But what is it? It comes from a terrible place. A place where there is nothing but pain. Endless pain, incomprehensible to our minds. Great, I muttered, as I noticed with a sinking heart that the screams from the girl behind me had stopped. Then I heard a wet crunch. I couldn't help it. I looked to see the professor tearing into that poor girl's throat with long black fangs dripping in green slime. I turned back to the kid, almost done with the straps. Just a few more seconds. What's your name anyway, kid? Claire. Claire, I said, my mind trying to stay focused. When you get out of these straps, I want you to pick up this chair and throw it at that thing, okay? I'll do the same thing. Then we make a run for it. Do you understand? Can you do that? I understand, said Claire. I do hope it works. I did hope it would work too. We have to make it work, Claire, I said, yanking off the last strap. Come on. We stood up together and I reached over to pick up a chair. I hurled it at the professor with all of my strength and it shattered against his boned back. I heard a terrible shriek and watched as Claire's chair followed behind. I grabbed Claire's arm with one hand and reached for my pocket knife with the other. The only way out of that room meant passing by the professor. We started running as I pulled the knife out and flicked it up. The professor stood, still shrieking, as the green slime mixed with the red blood and dripped down his chin. I took a wild stab at the professor's neck and I connected. I kept running with Claire, leaving the knife stuck in the professor's neck and made it to the door. I had my hand wrapped around the doorknob when I felt Claire pulling away from me. I looked back, helpless, as I saw the professor reach long black claws into her gut. I threw the door open and I left her there. Good God, I left her there. I made it outside the lab building somehow. I don't remember how. My mind just sort of shut down as I ran like hell, I guess. I did have the presence to go around and lock all of the doors from the outside. Then I got on the radio to campus security. You guys need to get the police over to the Astrophysics Center, ASAP. There was a goddamn massacre in there. The front door started to rattle, and I heard the god-awful shriek again. Repeat, said a voice over the walkie. Look, I said, call up Lawrence Summers right now. That was the president of Harvard at the time and I'd seen his signature on the papers in that folder with all of the consent forms. Tell him that the wormhole experiment has gone way the hell south. The rattling at the door stopped. I only prayed that that thing didn't figure out it could just break a window and crawl out that way. This is the janitor, right? Said a different voice on the other end of the walkie. Is this a joke? The wormhole experiment? Have you been drinking? Call Lawrence Summers. If you don't, I promise you, you'll never be able to live with yourself. Do it now. There was a horrible pause. I heard the professor trying the side door now, shrieking once again. 10-4. A fleet of black SUVs pulled up two minutes later. A team of heavily armed men jumped out and ran past me, breaking through windows and jumping inside. I heard a stream of gunfire and screams. So many screams and the professor's horrible shrieks. After a while, it was quiet, and a second team of men jumped through the broken windows. I didn't hear any more gunfire. I felt a hand on my shoulder and whipped around. A man was standing there. I don't remember a single thing about what he looked like, but I do remember our conversation. Tell me what happened, he said. I told him the full story, the same one that I've told you. We're prepared to give you a lot of money to sign an NDA. NDA? Non-disclosure agreement. It means that you can never tell anybody about what happened here tonight. How much? A million dollars. And a promotion. The man paused. You mean, you still want to work here after tonight? Somebody's got to clean this mess up, I said. Fine, of course. And one more thing. And what's that? asked the man. 
I want to know that this will never happen again. I want you to blow it all up and burn all of the notes. Of course. And I want to watch. Of course, said the man. And so, I thought it was over. But it's not. Last night, I saw the professor again. He looked me right in the eyes, flashed that smug grin and said, Hey there, chief. That's when I ran the hell out of there. The police don't believe me. I've sent a dozen emails to Lawrence Summers' assistants. I've called every number that I've found listed for him. I haven't heard anything back. I don't know who else to turn to. I'm afraid the professor is going to open the wormhole again. And I'm afraid this time he might bring his friends back with him. The Sleep Experiment This happened a few years ago. You may have heard rumours if you're on campus. Some even circulated online. Nobody knew what really happened. Because I'm the only one who knows, and I kept quiet, for a multitude of reasons. None of them matter now. Here's what really happened. The four of us were hand-picked for this experiment by Professor Richardson, because we'd all studied under him, worked under him, and, as much as anyone can, earned his confidence. He said this one was different. We had to keep it quiet. He wanted to keep details to a minimum. All he would tell us before going in was that he required a month of our lives, and that if he succeeded, sleep would never again be a necessity. Think of it, he said. Six to eight additional hours every day. Your month will be paid back before the year is out. If he was right, he'd have a Nobel Prize for sure. It would change the world. We believed in him. Sleep would become a hobby. Imagine that. We felt lucky to be a part of it. We went in there with the highest of hopes. We were so excited for a new future for humanity and for ourselves. I was the only one to leave that place. Week 1 Professor Richardson brought us out to the location in his van, explaining along the way what we were to do. For the purposes of the study, we were asked to remain in the compound, as he called it. We would be locked in, in fact, and deprived of windows and Wi-Fi. Other than endure patiently, we didn't have to do much of anything. My machine does all of the work, he explained. It uses a complex melange of sound waves to disrupt the processes of sleep, evolutionary appendices from the days before civilization. The most immediate side effect you'll notice is that you won't dream. Any other effects we noticed were to catalogue. We were, as he said, in uncharted territory, so we had to map out the dangers. The immensity of the project was inspiring enough. Then we saw the compound, the octagon, as it was known. A concrete, octagonal structure built at the end of a labyrinth of dirt roads, somewhere in the backwoods of Searcy, Arkansas. I'd never been able to find it again. The professor said it was originally intended as a jail for terrorists, but it was abandoned and never used. It's virtually impenetrable, invisible to satellites, but for us it had been stocked with all of the comforts we'd require for a month of dedication. I don't know if any of us expected to really conquer sleep. We thought, perhaps, a reduction in sleep requirements could be possible. We spent a fair amount of the first two days speculating on how the machine works and whether sleep really is an evolutionary appendix that the professor had claimed. By the third day of only getting three or four hours of sleep, contrary to feeling groggy, we were more awake and full of energy than ever. We were alert and ready to debate these ideas. That's when the excitement really hit us. He really did it, JT said. JT was a big, ginger-bearded guy. The sort of guy who still has a healthy collection of magic cards. We don't know that, James said, always a sceptic. He came from Australia just to study under Richardson, actually. The machine could be stimulating the adrenal glands to mildly dose us with adrenaline all throughout the day. Even were that so, wouldn't change the fact he beat sleep, I said. With our extra time, we were getting in tons of reading, playing a stupid amount of Call of Duty, and still had plenty of time to sit around and debate. 
I guess I have to admit it's pretty damn amazing, James said. We all felt it. It was almost euphoric. The excitement we felt for being possibly the first humans to live without the need for sleep. Technically, we still needed a few hours each night still, but we decided together it was more out of habit than necessity. Then, on the fourth day, Don said, There's something wrong. Don was a serious one. Super serious. He used to be a Franciscan, I'd heard. It showed. He didn't talk that much, and when he did, it was usually worth listening to. This time, he put into words something I'd been feeling, but I guess just kind of buried under the excitement. With the experiment, or... That was JT. I don't know, he said. It's a feeling. This constant uneasiness. Like this isn't going the way it's supposed to be going, or that we're in the wrong place. No, no, James said. I think that's it. It's this place. We all knew it was weird when we first saw it. This concrete octagon. But living in it, I think there's something wrong with this place like something terrible happened here. I understood it was never used, I said. Governments always say that about torture prisons. It's more than that, JT said. I feel it too. I thought it was just from lacking windows at first, but that's not it. I think it's the angles. It's like, the angles in this building don't add up to what they should. What if everyone's dead outside? Don asked. James jumped up so fast his chair clattered to the ground. Well, what are you saying, I asked. This is a haunted octagon? Yeah, James, JT said. Was it built on an octagonal Indian burial ground? Okay, you want to play that, he said. I can play. Look, the space around us transforms based on how we perceive it. Take a church. The people who go there perceive it as holy. So they do things like leave their crutches behind when they force themselves to walk, or light their candles, or whatever. These changes to the space only enhance the perception of holiness, and influence future visitors to perceive it in the same way, and change it in the same way. Haunted places are the same. For one reason or another, they begin to be perceived as haunted. The more they're perceived that way, the more they're imbued with hauntedness. Even if you've never seen the place before, you pick up on the subtle clues, if you're at all sensitive. In a way, it's true to say it's a haunted space. It's true to say the church is holy. Our interaction with that space has made it something more than just wood and sheetrock, or whatever. So what I'm saying is, maybe some things happened here, and we're picking up on it. Some bloody awful things. And in that sense, yes, it's a haunted octagon. No, Don said. Places are considered holy because an authority telegraphs it to whoever will listen. Just like haunted places make a lot of money off of dumb tourists. Whatever it is, I said. We all agree something isn't feeling right about our situation. Maybe it's the machine. I say we write it down as a side effect. On that point, at least we were all able to agree. It didn't put any of our uneasiness at rest, but we wrote it down. We somehow agreed upon the phrasing right away too. Acute sensations that we've entered into something where we aren't welcome. Week 2 We tried our best to ignore these feelings and carry on like we had been. Those first few days had been some of the best in our adult lives, but we never got back to those happy times. I realised around then how short-sighted of Richardson it had been to leave us there without any means of contacting the outside world. When I voiced that opinion, that's just what I'd been thinking, JT said. Richardson isn't a dumb guy, you get me? I think he did this on purpose. Why would he do that? I asked. For science, of course, he answered. It's one of those meta-studies where we're told it's about one thing but it's actually about how we react to the experiment. Like the Milgram experiment. Or it's not his choice, James said. The government is making him do it, and that machine is designed to control us. Or some sort of cult, Scientologists. 
This is a government built installation, JT said. That actually makes sense. Not the Scientology part though. Think about it, James started, but I interrupted. Okay, okay, I said. Let's just come back to Earth for a second. Best case scenario, Richardson is just a jerk who doesn't care about our personal well-being, right? Give it a rest, Don said, the one I least expected to snap back at me. Stop trying to act like the most rational guy in the room. You don't know what he's into. He's into other things, things he'll never talk about publicly. I looked at the others and saw similar confusion. What are you talking about? I've heard a little about this, actually, James said. He has some fringe ideas. Let's just say he's not the respected academic he presents himself to be, Don said. I've read some of the content he doesn't publish. He thinks, and very seriously believes, that there's something else, something besides this, he knocked on the table. Something more than material stuff. That's not completely strange, I said with a shrug. I was expecting worse. He put it this way, Don continued, ignoring me. Think back to the beginning of existence. There had to be conditions such that the universe's existence was possible. If the universe wasn't possible, then it couldn't have come to exist. Does that stand to reason? We nodded. Okay. And those conditions cannot be material, nor laws of matter, since those came into being with the existence of the universe. So whatever those conditions are, they have to be something other than the basic substance of the universe. Does that make sense? I guess, I said. This isn't turning into an argument for God, is it? He shook his head. It's an argument for something that continues to exist. Except we can't even say that, because ideas like something and exist are developed for and by and within physical reality. This is something pre-physical, something pre-existence. Whatever it is allowed the universe to spontaneously be, who knows what else it's been doing these billions of years. Just asking that question is already violating the stipulations, I started saying, my background in philosophy kicking in. Yes, Don said, but he believes. He thinks it's the source of free will. Our brains touch it somehow. And so he believes he can reach it, study it, use it. I didn't get to read much more than that. And if this experiment is something he's not putting on the books, James added, it may have to do with his more peculiar interests. So instead of eliminating sleep, he's trying to make us see God, I asked sarcastically. I don't know, brother, Don said. I'm just saying, if he thinks the brain touches another reality, this is just the kind of experiment he'd want to try to prove his theory. You think he has this room bugged? JT asked. I think he might be in here somewhere, I said, without even thinking what I was saying. They looked at me waiting for an explanation, and with what looked like fear in their eyes. Strange we should be so afraid of this man we admired less than two weeks ago. I sometimes feel someone watching me sleep, I explained, my voice starting to tremble. I figured it was one of you at first. I feel it especially when I'm not quite awake, but not quite asleep. Those moments when you wake for a few seconds to adjust your pillow. I could feel and see and hear someone standing over me, just breathing and watching, and I was too close to unconsciousness to do anything about it. Then I just fell back to sleep. I could see the terror filling the other's eyes while I spoke. I've been feeling it too, Don said almost in a whisper, like he was scared to be heard. I thought I was losing it. Me too, James said. Someone else is in here. We drew closer together, our eyes darting nervously around the grey concrete room. We were all feeling the same thing, I'm sure, that we were trapped. Trapped inside this horrible building with someone or something else. Wait, wait, JT said. What would this person be eating? We don't see our food disappearing. There's no way out. There isn't really anywhere to hide. We've got to start being sensible. I let out a sigh of relief, because he was right. Okay, let's think about this, I said. Let's say this is another effect of the machine. Phase two, 
Paranoia. Phase two, paranoia, Don said with a consenting nod. We wrote it down. The next day, when we all gathered together for breakfast, JT asked, Have you all had any dreams? We all shook our heads. Richardson was right on the money with that one, I said. Yes, he said. Do you know that feral children don't dream? How do we know that? James asked. They tell us, the few that get socialised. They say that dreaming is something that starts only after. When they have language, object permanence and all that stuff. What about dogs? I asked. Like chasing rabbits in their sleep. Autonomic responses. Maybe language and object permanence only impacts the ability to remember dreams, James said. Both are consistent with the superficial data. The onus is on you to prove otherwise. JT scoffed. What's your point anyway? Don asked. The point is, being dreamless, do you think it's healthy? I don't think it's healthy. I think the machine isn't making us not need sleep. It's making us not feel tired. I think all of this might be happening because we aren't dreaming. We can't really answer, can we? James said. Dreams naturally accompany REM sleep, so we don't have any studies that differentiate between the effects of not dreaming and of not sleeping. Or maybe we are dreaming, and the dreams are just going somewhere else, JT said. I didn't know what he meant by that. Nobody did. But we all stopped talking then and dispersed. Something about it felt too true. Week 3 Our gatherings for theoretical discussions became rarer and rarer. We tended to isolate ourselves and eyed each other with suspicion. I still had those feelings of uneasiness and of unwelcomeness every day. And each night, the figure standing over me. I was sleeping even less now, about an hour tops. So little sleep that I'd started to catch it running away. The last time, I was awake enough to see where it was going. It's this one particular corner of my room that always struck me as peculiar. I caught myself staring at it, even when I didn't want to. It's a point where the angles are strange. My eyes had trouble focusing on it. The figure skulked straight to that point and disappeared into it. When I woke up fully, I questioned whether I'd hallucinated the whole thing. Perhaps phase three was hallucinations. I went over to that corner and looked at it more closely. It smelled strange, like turpentine. Then, the more I stared at it, the more I forced my eyes to focus, I was sure. Sure that something was moving inside. And it was watching me. I heard this awful, hate-filled sound come from deep in the corner then. I didn't wait around to understand what made that noise. I left that room for good. I took all of my short naps in the library from then on. When lying in the library, I overheard JT talking to someone in the corridor. He was telling him about the angles again. He said there are more degrees in the building than can possibly be in a standard enclosed shape. 2.7488 degrees more, he said. Just enough to drive you nuts, but not enough to be obvious. Whoever he was talking to said something I didn't understand. Something like, those are the degrees of ripping. The voice was distorted somehow, so I can't be sure. What I was sure of, I didn't recognise that voice at all. Whoever JT was talking to wasn't one of us. Maybe silly, but I was scared. I stayed there, pretending to be asleep while JT walked by. And as he did, I felt someone or something come into my room and stand over me. Then it went away. After a minute or so of telling myself I was being foolish, I went following after JT. I didn't see him anywhere. I bumped into James, and he also said he hadn't seen JT. Have you seen or heard anyone who shouldn't be in here? I asked him. James looked at me with a mixture of surprise and terror. How do you know? he asked. I haven't told anyone. About what? He told me he'd heard his mother calling to him. Not a faint sound as he confused for his mother, but her voice, clear as mine, calling out to him. 
He almost answered her, he said. Almost. Then he stopped himself. She's been dead for a year, man, he said. Whatever was calling me, it wasn't my mother. I saw he was shaking, and his hands were clenched. I told him to hang in there. It might be oral hallucinations. I'd been hearing things too, a crying child. So low at first, I thought it was the plumbing. We should call a meeting, he said. I thought about JT and what I'd heard moments ago. Let's just tell Don, I said. As a side effect of the machine, it makes sense, Don said after we told him. The sounds aren't supposed to be audible, yet somehow our brains must be picking up their random patterns and interpreting them as something. The brain assigns a memory to make the pattern meaningful. Do you believe that? I asked. Not for a second, James said. But we had a shortage of rational explanations, and that was a pretty good one. I'd hoped he was right. A few days later, I found James in the gym, pounding away at the punching bag. I asked him if he was okay. He ignored me, so I went back to the reading room. A few minutes later, he was behind me. That voice I've been hearing isn't my mother, he said. Of course not, I said. We'd already decided that after all. No, I mean, I don't know what I mean. It's just, my mother was a kind person. Even if this voice is trying to sound like her, it's not like her at all. It's not kind. It's not human. I put down my book and looked him full on to see if he was serious. He was, very much so. She's been telling me about all sorts of things, he said. She asked me if he remembered the shed. I couldn't say anything to that. I was speechless. I never talked about that. For good reason. It took me years to come to terms with what happened. It was a long time ago. I was out playing behind our house in the woods, as I often did. I liked to construct awful tree houses. I went a little off property and came to this shed. I'd never seen it before. It looked old though. I remember that. I heard a kid crying inside. Thinking I might have a friend to make tree houses with, I looked through the window. The kid was all chained up and there was a dog bowl on the floor. I wanted to help, but I knew I was trespassing. I looked around. That's when I saw this man off about 20 feet into the woods. He was dressed all in black, old-fashioned clothes, like 19th century clothes. He had to have been watching me the whole time, expressionless. I went running all the way home. I was so scared, I didn't tell my parents about it until I was supposed to go to bed, and I had to explain why I was terrified to go to sleep. They had the cops out right away, and they found the shed. I heard they found the chains in the bowl, but the kid was gone. I'd always blamed myself for not helping the kid right away. Do you? James asked. Yes. Okay, well, she's been telling me how to get out. I looked at him without a word, because he sounded so manic. She said, there's a secret exit inside JT. We just have to cut him open to get to it. James, I said unsure what else to say at this point. Oh, I know, he said with a gulp. I know it's not true, I just had to tell someone. I don't know what's going on in this place, he added. I'm scared, man. So was I. We had to get out of that octagon. Week 4 James and I started looking for ways out after that. Since we weren't sleeping at all now, we had plenty of time to do it. Every time we thought we'd found something, it was a dead end. It was while we were doing this that we saw Don standing alone in the corner with his back to us. What's going on? James asked me. Something about it just seemed strange. Don, you okay? He turned around and with a smile gave us a big wave. Bye guys, he said and walked around the corner. I looked at James to see if he was thinking the same thing as me that something bad was about to happen and he was already looking back at me. We took running after him. He was at the end of the next corridor already, getting in the elevator. Don, no, we shouted and ran after him, but the doors closed before we got there. He went up. 
The thing is, the octagon is a one floor building. There's no elevator. Never before or after. I don't know where Don went or what I think I saw really happened, but I know I never saw Don ever again. I don't understand, James said. What's happening? Before we could take time to think about it, a group of people rounded the corner and were walking towards us. I think we should go, I said. Who are they? James, let's go, I said. Why are they blurry? I don't know, but we're going. I grabbed his arm and pulled him with me. Then I ran. I ran until I got to the kitchen and I hid myself between the wall and the fridge. I was sure James was right behind me. I could hear his footfall the whole way. But when I looked, he was gone. I stayed there until my body couldn't really take it anymore. Probably a few hours. When I slipped out, I saw someone peering at me from around the doorway. I was so startled, I backed up against the wall. It was a little boy. Hello, I said. Then I heard screams. The boy was gone. More screams. I couldn't just leave someone in distress. Not again. I ran towards the screams, scared of what might be happening to James. I heard a scream again, but this one choked out. It was coming from JT's room. I wished then, and still wish, I hadn't opened that door. James was in there. He'd sliced JT open, and he was feeling around in his guts. The shocked, agonised expression was frozen on JT's face. What did you do? I asked. I have to get out, James said, as he dug through JT's intestines. I backed out of the room. I didn't know what else to do. I just had to find somewhere to hide until Richardson could get us out of there. Once I was out of the room, I heard James saying, Mum? And then, Oh no. Oh no. And then he screamed. I ran back in. James was gone. The doorway to the room hadn't left my sight. There's no way he got out. But he was gone. And noxious, black smoke was coming from JT's abdomen. It smelled like burning tyres. I went back to the kitchen. I found a supply of candles, melted some wax onto paper towels, and I stuffed my ears with it. Then I curled up in a corner, with my eyes closed, and waited for sleep to come. I waited a long time, but eventually it came. When I woke up, Professor Richardson was shaking me. He'd already pulled the paper towels out of my ears. I thought he'd come early. I found out later I'd been asleep for several days. He asked me where the others went. I told him everything, as much as I understood. I tried to take him to JT's body, but it was gone. Not a trace of blood. He took me to a hospital after that to make sure I was okay. I'll foot the bill, he said. Also, you can forget about your student loans. Is that how it is? I asked. I put you in danger, he said. So yes, you've earned it, if you keep quiet. I told him I couldn't keep quiet because of what happened to the others. You don't think those things really happened, do you? Would all the laws of the physical universe suspend themselves just for you four? No, those were waking dreams. You weren't supposed to dream at all. I thought I'd compensated for it. The machine needs tweaking, that's science. The others are fine. They'll be laying low for a while, until I publish the results. Please do the same. I wanted to believe him. I've always considered myself a rational person. I just didn't believe him. Yes, it could have all been a dream. That would be the simplest explanation. But it was no dream. I tried to find the others. I never could. I don't think they're fine at all. I tried to tell the police about it, but they wanted evidence. I couldn't even show them the octagon. James, JT, Don, if you're out there and read this, let me know you're okay. And everyone else, let me tell you what I think. 
I think Professor Richardson was right about one thing. Sleep really is something we evolved to protect us. Except, not from the creatures that roam the forests at night. It protects us from something much worse. Something all around us. It's not obsolete at all. Thank whatever you believe in, that you have sleep and you dream. <laughs>